Hello, how are you? My name is Keith once again, and I'm thankful today because uh, today's a great day. I just want to show you something about how to be saved. So I know so many people are still so much confused about how exactly can I be saved? Is there a certain procedure? Is there a certain way that I can do? Or is there a process of how I can be saved? I know there's a lot of simplicity in, uh, in Jesus Christ. But then you have also to be sure that you're being saved the right way, not through other different ways which might lead you to maybe getting confused or maybe different perversions and stuff like that. So um, I'll, start, I, I'll start by uh, Hebrews 9.27 where the Bible says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment. So we know you die once and then judgment. So... It's die, once you die, then judgment. All right. So this one is given and is absolute. So once you die, it's judgment. But then, do you know where you will spend your eternity after you die? Will you spend it in heaven or hell? Because there's no other way. You either spend it in hell or in heaven. And... Uh, Definitely we know God wants you to be saved from hell, from not going to hell. Because there are only two ways, two places. There is a hell or heaven. There is no other thing that you can say, you say I will go here, like the way Catholics they say, I will go to purgatory, I'll, I, I'll get burnt a little bit for my sins and then I will go to heaven. No, there is nothing like that. It's hell or heaven. Once you get to that, whatever you call purgatory, then you will never get out of there. It's uh, so clear and the Bible is very clear. And in 1 Timothy uh, 2.4, the Bible says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come to and to the knowledge of the truth. So Jesus wants us to come to the knowledge of the truth so that we can be saved. We can be saved from going to hell. We can go to heaven. So what truth? You see, many people can ask, so if we have to know the truth, then what truth are we knowing? The truth is the truth which will send you and which will give you eternal life. So in short, is the truth to eternal life. So if you want life, all right, I can write here, there is a death, death, or life. So if you want life, there is a truth that you need to know. There is something that you need to know. If you want to stay and die, then you don't need to do anything. Continue. Actually, that's why you hear the Church, church of Satan says one of their mottos is... Uh, do as thy wilt, all right? Do as you feel, as you want to do. But they know very well your end is where? Death. Okay, so the truth is, is found in Jesus Christ. So John 3.15, the Bible says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the only way you can get life which is eternal is by believing in him. Okay, believing in him. So how exactly can you believe and how can you get that eternal life? You see, there are people who will ask, so yes, it's by believing then. Then how do I get to believe? <laughs> you see? And the, the Bible in the book of Acts 13, 38, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Which man? Jesus Christ. So with Jesus Christ, with Jesus, we have eternal life. All right. So through this man, Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. So you have to understand about that. And verse 39 says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So if you believe in this man, Jesus Christ, then you are justified. All right. You're justified. And I always say that justify is literally means just if I had not sinned. It's as if you never did anything. Just if I had not sinned. So when you believe in Jesus, you're justified. Simple and very clear. So before you get saved, first you have to realize that you're lost. Uh, can you save someone who, is, who doesn't know that he needs salvation? 
let's say for instance uh, somebody is uh, let's say for instance somebody is uh, inside water and uh, he had fainted or maybe he was a drunk guy and uh, being drunk he slipped and fell inside water and then he is drunk and all of a sudden he becomes sober because he's drowning the moment he realizes hey i'm in water that's the moment he says now i need to be saved from water and then he starts calling for help but before he realizes that i'm i'm drowning he doesn't think that he needs any salvation so unless you realize that you're lost you can never think that you need any salvation so unless you realize that you're lost okay so you have to realize that you're lost that's the main thing okay in romans 10:3 the Bible tells us, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. You see, there are many people who think, because I can do this, I can do that, I can do that. I've, I've done a, a couple of things in the church. I was baptized when I was young. I did this, or maybe I'm a good man. Generally, I'm a good man. I give to the poor. I help this and that. I don't, I don't curse. I don't shout. I don't beat people. I don't steal. I think I'm a good man. I think I deserve to go to heaven. There are people who think that. But the Bible tells us very clear. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And in Romans 3.23, the Bible tells us, For all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. So if all people have sinned, then it means you're also included. Let me ask you, why do you think people die? I know you can't answer me, you're there in the uh, watching, but <laughs> let me give you the answer. We die because we are sinners. If we had no sin, we could not die. We die because we are sinners. Death is because we are sinners. So death is only for the sin. All right? We die because we have sinned. But if we did not have any sin, then nobody could die. That one already tells you that you need to be saved from death, from sin, from hell, from getting lost, from sin. You have to be saved from that. In Romans 5.12... The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So by one man, who is this man? Adam. <laughs> so by Adam, Adam, there was, death came in. This guy messed us up, all of us, all right? So by this one man, uh, death came. So, how can we be able to be sinned, uh, to be saved? So, if by one man, Adam, there came sin, then it means by one man, also sin can go away. Because this guy brought sin, and then this one can take the sin away, okay? So, can we really earn salvation by doing good things? You see, there are those people, like I've said, who think I have done this and this and this. I'm just a great guy. I'm a good person. And I do what is right. Can we really earn salvation by doing good things or works or following the law? If you say, I will just do what the law says. I will say, I'll do what uh, is written in the laws of Moses. Then can I be saved? There are those people who think that. But in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you are saved by faith. We are told that you are saved by faith. Okay? So faith saves you. You are not saved by anything else. You are not saved by works. There are those people who think they can be saved by works. Okay? You can't be saved by works. The Bible already tells us here, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't say, there's something that I've done. You see, before, before I got saved, before I really understood what is salvation, I used to think that there's a certain prayer that I said. Somebody, I, I went to a meeting and then, you know, they were just praying and saying, okay, those who want to be saved, come over here. And then, of course, we came over there and then we're told, okay, repeat this prayer. Uh, God come into my heart and all that and and then I went home and I was confused did I did I really get saved by the way did I did I say the prayer so well or did I mistake something did I use the right terminology and then every day 
I was always co convincing myself, Keith, you're safe, don't worry. But then deep down in my heart, I was feeling, no, there's something missing. I don't understand what's wrong. Because every day at my bed, I was always like, oh God, please. Please, when you come, like anytime I see uh, people talking about rapture, people talking about, you see this happening, see Israel, you see uh, Jesus might come anytime. I, I used to think, Jesus, what if you come? I, I could even pray and tell God, please, if you're coming today, just scare me. Make sure that I'm so scared so that I can say that prayer again. I can say that prayer again. So I trusted in a prayer. I never trusted in Jesus. I never literally, you see, that's how people get confused. And at the end of the day, you're condemned all your life. You keep on thinking, did I really say it? This is the works. I was trusting in a thing, a certain thing. I was not trusting in Jesus Christ. You see, many people will say, yeah, I trust in Jesus as long as I mentioned him there. I know because I said that prayer, I will be saved. No, you can be saved by saying a certain thing. Salvation is purely a gift from God. It's not anything that we deserved. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if the wages of sin is death, when you sin, then you die. But you are told the gift, but, but, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So this is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. All right. So we have a gift. The gift of eternal life. Okay. So should we accept the gift? Is, ca can you buy a gift? Can you say, okay, uh, please sell me this gift? No. You take it because it's already given to you. There's nothing that you can pay for a gift. If it is you're paying, then it's no longer a gift. Can someone be justified by the works of the law? Can you really be justified by the works of the law? Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but the, by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The Bible tells us very well, the works of the law, no flesh can be justified. Do you know something that in the Bible we have 600, 613 laws? All right? We have 613 laws. How can you be able to fulfill all these laws, 613 laws? How will you know which one are fulfilled today and which one have left? There are so many laws. Others are saying don't shave the sides of your hair, the sides of your beard. Don't uh, do this. Don't keep nails like this. Don't walk a certain way. Don't, uh, if it's ladies, don't go anywhere without, uh, uh, you know, putting something on your head. And men don't have long. There are so many things in the 613 laws. Can you fulfill all of them? It's not possible. And that's why Jesus can only justify us through faith. Faith in what? In his finished work. He already did some work. So if you believe and you have faith in that work that he did, then you don't have to think about these laws. You can have faith in Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit comes inside you, you will be able, he will be able to guide you to do what is right. And to be able to, you see, Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He only came to fulfill the law. When you have Jesus inside you, by faith, you have received him by faith, then this, this 613 laws, it will not be an issue for you. He will guide you. The Holy Spirit will guide you every day. He will show you, don't do this, do this. He will, he will grieve inside you. You see? When someone is saved, he cannot enjoy sin. When you want to do something, you feel the Holy Spirit is grieving inside you and you're like, ah, I should not be doing this. Um, I should not be here. Why? Because Jesus came to fulfill the law. So all you need is to trust in what he did for you. Okay. So does God offer a free gift of eternal life, but you can only access it by faith? Is it really true that you can only access it by faith? Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted 
for righteousness. So once you have faith, your faith, uh, your faith, faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, righteousness. So once you have faith, then your faith is counted for righteousness. And the Bible clearly tells us that you can't enter heaven unless you're righteous. So who will enter heaven? Righteous people and forgiven people. Because we are sinners, we cannot enter heaven by, by ourselves. We can only enter through Jesus. And how can you enter through Jesus? By believing in him, believing in what he did for you. So only two people can enter heaven. Righteous people, Jesus is righteous. He can enter any time and you know, do whatever you want to do. But then, as well, right, uh, forgiven people. Once you're forgiven and you're forgiven by believing, by trusting, by having faith, that's the only way you can enter heaven. Okay, but then faith, faith in what? Somebody can ask, faith in what? How can we know? What exactly are we having faith on? It is faith in the gospel. Jesus gave us the gospel. He revealed it to Apostle Paul. And then when you believe this gospel, you will be saved. So what is the gospel? The gospel, the gospel, the gospel Found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's all about the good news. All right. The gospel is the good news of what Jesus did for us. It's really good news. Why is it called good news? Because we deserve to be lost. We deserve to die. We deserve to go to hell. We deserve, uh, you see, all these things. We were already lost. We deserve to go to hell. But then the good news is, it's like, you need to go to hell. You're a bad person. But then somebody comes and says, no, 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 I have some good news. Believe in me, and then you will not go to hell, you will not die, you will not suffer. There is some good news. You will go to heaven. So that is the good news. The gospel is the good news. So what does the gospel talk about? If we go there to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it tells us exactly what this good news is. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. So, he says, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you. So, you have to hear the gospel preached. All right. You have to hear the gospel preached. That is the first thing that you have to hear. And then you have to receive the gospel. Receive. You have to receive the gospel. And then you have to stand. Stand in the gospel. Have you heard the gospel preached? Have you received the gospel? Are you standing in the gospel? Then, verse 2 says, By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. So you are saved saved by the gospel. All right? Then also it says, you're saved by the gospel, you keep in memory. Keep in memory. So you have to keep in memory the gospel. And then number six, you have to do what? You have to believe truthfully. Truthfully. So there are a number of things you have to understand. This. <laughs> you have to hear the gospel preached. You have to receive the gospel. You have to stand in the gospel. You are saved by the gospel. You have to keep in memory the gospel. And you have to believe truthfully. Not believe in vain. Okay. So what are you believing? Okay. Listen to what Paul says in verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So Paul is not giving us his own things. He also received as well. Okay. And then 
how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So he's saying, I'm giving you how. How did Jesus die? How did Jesus die? Does anyone really know how Jesus died? Jesus shed his blood for us. All right. Jesus shed his blood for us. He shed his really, really, very, very uh, sinless blood for us. We were supposed to die. But then he said, no, 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 guys, don't worry. I'm going to do it for you. And then there are five folds. Huh? Five folds of how of salvation. Number one is that Christ died. Okay. Number two, for our sins. All right. Very important. You have to understand that Christ died. Then you have to understand it was for our sins. And then you have to understand something else that he was buried. All right. Then you have to understand that he rose again. And then, according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. Why is it important to understand this? Why is it important? Christ died. It means Jesus, God was manifest in the flesh. He came and he died in the flesh. Okay? He was here as man. God. For our sins, it means that he did not just die for no reason. He died for a cause, and the cause is us, so that we can be forgiven given our sins. He died for our sins. He was the atonement for our sins. The Bible says that without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So, through him, we were able to be forgiven. It was his purpose, his death, was to forgive our sins. He did not just die for no reason. He was buried. Why? Buried means he became the unleavened bread. He's, he, took his, he took our sins with him. Only people who are sinful are supposed to be buried. Okay? But then he became sin for us. He took all our sins with him to the grave and left them there. So it's very important. He rose again by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you believe that Jesus rose again, then you also believe that God, the Holy Spirit, exists. And also the same Holy Spirit who rose Jesus will rise you on that day. Then according to the scriptures, it's very important because if you believe the scriptures, scripture is the word of God. If you believe the scripture, then you believe that God the Father wrote the scriptures. He inspired everyone. So this is how, how. This is how Christ died. And it's really, really important to understand how he died. If there was not this blood, then Jesus could not, we could not have been saved. Why? Because in Leviticus 17, 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given you the, the, the blood to make atonement for your souls. Unless there is this blood, then you can't be forgiven. For those who try to say there's another way you can go to Christ without the blood, then it's wrong. It can't happen. There have to be blood. There has to be blood. All right? So having understood that, you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus do all this? Why, why, why did he do all this? Why did he have to die? What was the main reason? Why, why did he just choose, I will die? Why? What was the reason behind that? It was because of love. You know, when, when you love, you can do anything. And uh, I always tell people that love is, uh, love is an action. It's not really an emotion. Yes, it's beyond emotion. If you just love someone because uh, of how you feel, what about the time that they wrong you? Are you going to say, now I don't love you anymore? No, love is an action. I can just imagine Christ at the cross at that time. People are spitting on him. Others are beating him. Others are doing mocking him and doing all those things. And the same people who are doing this to him are the ones that he loves. Do you think there was an emotion at that time? Do you think when Jesus was, was uh, praying until he prayed and uh, he, 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 
until he sweat blood. Do you think there was a good emotion that time? He was like, I don't want to do this. These people are really agitating me. But because of love, I will show it by action. So he did it. He showed the action. So love is more of an action. And that's why you see in relationships, people who just take love as, a, as a just an emotion alone, then they forget about the action, then they, they, they always end up in wrongles. All the time there's divorces and breaking. And that's why we are told Jesus is an example it, the way Jesus loves us, loves the church, should be the same way of even how marriage should be. A husband should love his wife until he can literally die for them. And even a wife should be so submissive, just the same way we are supposed to be submissive to Jesus. You see the whole aspect of love, it was brought so well by Jesus Christ. Let's see, First John 4.10. It says, hearing is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and has sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, there's something that is, uh, uh, I was watching the other day. And uh, it is a, a video by a certain lady. I don't know if she was called who. It's called Love Liberates. Love Liberating is literally if you love someone so much, you care more about their happiness even more than yours. Sometimes you can love someone so much such that it doesn't it doesn't matter how if he's doing wrong to you or something you just want them to be happy. Sometimes even you can see somebody you love them so much but then there's a hindrance which you, you see maybe they are not even happy with you and you tell them since I really love you so much just just do whatever you want to do just just go there I will do whatever I can do but as long as you're happy even if it doesn't involve me at the cross, at the cross, Jesus was really pained. He was not feeling happy himself. He was torn. He was beaten. He was, all these things were happening to him. But then he said, even if I'm not feeling happy, even if I'm not seeing this one favoring me right now, but because of love, I'm going to do it for them. I love them so much, such that I will do it for them. So, to whom did he do this for? Who did Jesus do this for? Very important. First John 2.2, 2, it says, And this propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus did this for us, for the sins of everyone in the world. Everyone, every little person in the world received this. Whether you're black, you're white, you're what, you're what, as long as you're alive, there's a chance for you to be saved. This one he did for us, okay? So are we saved once or can we be saved over and over? Are we saved once or can we be saved several times? First Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins. The, uh, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So Jesus did this once. And after that, you're saved once. He will not keep on getting there and uh, saving you over and over. No, he died once. And if he died once, you have assurance of salvation. You know, he did it for me, and that's it. And once I believe I have faith in what he did for me, then I am saved. And that's it. And I can lose my salvation. So why did he have to shed his blood? Why, why is this blood so important? Why is this blood so important like this? Hebrews 9.22 tells us, And almost all things are by the law, purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So the Bible already tells us that Everything which comes to pass has to be purged with blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So, Jesus became the lamb, the lamb of God, to be able to be shed, his blood to be shed like a lamb, so that now we can be able to be forgiven of our sins. In uh, the book of John 1.29, it says, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. 
So John sees Jesus coming there and he says, this is the lamb. This is the person who is going to take away the sin of the world. Yes, the sin was here through Adam. But Jesus, the lamb, is going to take it away. Why? Because Jesus came to bring us redemption, to redeem us from our sins. Before, we could only have remission. I said it in another video that remission, it goes and then it will come back again. Like when somebody is in cancer ward and they have done chemo, chemotherapy, you say, now the cancer is on remission. But then, of course, we know it will come back again. Then you will do chemotherapy again, over, and then remission, you know, all that. But Jesus came to redeem us, to redeem us of our sins once and for all. We can see this, Romans 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So before... People could only be redeemed with the blood of cows and goats and sheep and all that. But when Jesus came, his blood was so powerful that now we never got remission of sins. We got redemption, okay? Which is a very different thing, which means that you have been forgiven once and you can't lose your salvation. That is your surety. So has blood always been all that important in the Bible? Or is Jesus who is coming with this importance of the blood now? Has the blood always been important? Let's see. Leviticus 17, 11. I already quoted that, but let me uh, read it again. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. All right? What is atonement? It is the blood that makes atonement. Atonement. Atonement literally means to be made at one meant. It's like you're meant to be one with God. You were separated by sin, but now you're made to be at one with God. Now God loves you back, atones you through the blood. So it, before, it used to be the blood of goats and cows and, you know, all those kind of things. But now when Jesus came, his blood gave us atonement. That's why it is very important to have the blood of Jesus Christ. So is there anything else that uh, could redeem us apart from the blood of Christ? Some people can wonder, is there, is, is there anything else that uh, can redeem us? Let's see what the Bible says. In First Peter 118, the Bible says, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversations, received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you could not be able to be redeemed by anything else, not by money gold or silver or anything or something that you could do, something you could work for. You could not be redeemed by that. But a redemption came through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is the only blood which could redeem us. Now, this one is explained very well in understanding that, uh, do you know, in the, in the time of the Lord, the time before Jesus came, all through Adam, when people died, they never went to heaven. They went to uh, Abraham's bosom. We know a very good story of uh, Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus. And he could see Lazarus there and then the rich man is here in hell and Lazarus is there at Abraham's bosom. Why were, was uh, these guys not going directly to heaven? It's because the blood of goats and rams and cows and all those could not be able to redeem you. You could only get remission, forgiveness of sins, but no redemption. All right? Redemption is to be totally, completely forgiven of your sins. It was, yes, you've been forgiven your sins, but that blood was not really powerful as much. But when Jesus came and he died, the Bible tells us that he went down to set the captives free. Who are these captives who are set free? The people who are at Abraham's bosom. So those guys, he went there and he took them up and took them with him in heaven. And we see that explained very well in the book of Matthew, whereby when Jesus died, there were so many people who were dead before. The dead saints walked in the streets of Jerusalem. <laughs> so it's, it's a very 
it is only said in one in in one verse but it means a lot it shows literally when jesus died and he went down there he came and took out the saints who had died with him and went with them in heaven and now the bible tells us that now hell has expanded uh, this uh, Abraham's bosom and hell now has become one. Hell has expanded, so many people can go there, those who don't want to believe. And now everyone who dies goes straight to heaven. That's why the Bible says to be absent in the body, to be present with God. So now when you die, you're sure you're going to heaven. You're sure you're not going to some purgatory or some, you know, Abraham's bosom down there. No, you're going straight to heaven and that's really really important to know how powerful this blood was this is blood which was really powerful to be able to redeem people to heaven than just staying down there and not knowing what is next and we see colossians 1 14 says in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins so jesus gave us redemption through his blood we are redeemed through this blood, okay? First John 1 John 1.7, the Bible says, But if we walk in the light, as in, in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Do you understand the word all, what it means? All does not mean uh, the future sins are not forgiven. No. Once you believe you trust in this blood, your present, past, present, and future sins all sins are forgiven. You're forgiven every sin that you've ever done. And even those that you will ever do, they're already forgiven. And that's why you cannot lose your salvation. And that's why it's very important to understand this. And when you understand this, you will turn from doing what I used to do back then, every day sitting on my bed and praying, God, please, if you come today, scare me. Scare me so that I can say that prayer again. I trusted in a prayer. I never trusted in this. I never knew how powerful the blood is. I never understood how well this blood is, how good, this great this blood is, and why I need to trust this, this blood of Jesus Christ. All right? So salvation is by the shed blood of Jesus, and you need to trust that blood to be saved. Romans 3.25, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So what is a propitiation? Propitiation is the act of appeasing wrath. God was feeling so bad about people, man having sinned, and he was like, I want to finish these people. The wages of sin is death. I want them dead. But then he says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So if they have to die, then they, they have to shed their blood. But then he says, no, there's one way I can do. If they can, if they can see blood shed, I will know that sin has gone. So before it used to be shed the blood of animals. and You see, but when God saw that man cannot even listen to that, he said, let me just send Jesus to come, my son to come here. God the Father said, let me send my son Jesus to come here. And then I can propitiate using his blood. I can look at Jesus there. You can just imagine Jesus at the cross and then God the Father is there looking and he's pouring all his wrath and he's saying, I just want to finish. You know, I just want to finish this. I want to, you know, appease all the wrath through Jesus who was sinless. Doing that for you because of your sin. It's like you go to a court and you have killed someone. And then the judge says, you know, I'm a righteous judge. And uh, the only way that can be done here is you have to pay for what you've done, killing somebody. So what do murderers get? The murderers are also killed. Murderers are also killed or they are given life imprisonment. And then you say, it's okay, I know I've killed someone. I, I have to be killed as well, hanged maybe or... You know, anything that you want to do, judge, it's okay. I understand. I'm a, I'm a murderer and it has to happen to me. But then just before you're taken out of the court, somebody comes and says, listen, judge, I have something here. I will give myself. Let me, let me die for this man. Let him go scot-free. Let me die for the sake of this man. 
What do you think will be in your mind at that time? Why are you doing this for me? I'm the one who was killed. I'm the one who has done this wrong thing. Why are you doing this for me? And then he will tell you, it's because of love. I'm, I'm doing this because of love. I just don't want to see you dead. But I'm, I, I just want you to know that I really love you. I just want you to trust me. Trust me. Don't worry. And then you, you're like, no, 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 please don't do this. He, he tells you, no, trust me. Trust me. I'm going to do it for you. That is exactly what Jesus did. You are supposed to go and die. Go to hell. But then Jesus comes up and says, it's okay. It's okay. Just trust me. Trust me. I'm going to do it for you. I, I love you so much that I, I will do it for you. That's exactly what Jesus did. And if you trust in him, you trust in what he did for you, then you're saved. You're saved from eternal damnation, from going to hell, from death. That's really important to understand. If you don't understand that, it will be so bad. Let's see verse 26 what it says. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Why are you boasting as if, as if you, you saved yourself? Why are you boasting? The Bible asks us, where is boasting then? It is excluded. Don't boast about anything. But by what law? Of works? Just because you think you did something? Because you think, I did this. I went to the church and then pastor put his hand on me. And then I believe that if pastor told me I'm saved, then I'm saved. No. 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 You're saved only if you trust that this, 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 this work was done for you. If you trust this work was for you, then you're saved. Not because of what the pastor will tell you or what a friend will tell you. or uh, Having gone to uh, be baptized, you see, I was baptized. I did this. I did this. Not of works. Not anything that you can do. There is literally nothing that you can do that can get you salvation. Of works? Nay, but the law of faith. Okay, by faith, the law of faith. Faith in what? In this finished work of Jesus Christ. If Jesus did this for me, this is the finished work. All right, finished. Finished work. This is the finished work of Jesus Christ. So if Jesus did all the work, why are you going to do another work? Why do you have to do another work? Why do you have to believe in another thing? Why do you have to say, I'm, I'm going to do this, I will do this, I will, I will save myself by certain thing, or I will give tithe and uh, I will give offering because I gave to the poor, because I, I saved someone from house rent, uh, and now God feels better for me? No. There's nothing that you can do. That's why the Bible says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, this is the power of God. When you understand how much the, the message of the cross is, it is the power of God unto salvation. But then when you think of other things, I see so many people try to say, I, Jesus come into my heart. How can he come to your heart? By asking? Where is the gospel? And I'm going to make another video about asking. Can you really ask Jesus into your heart? Can you? Did he say ask or did he say believe? Did he say trust? You see how people get so much confused and they believe in other doctrines which don't even make sense. He, he said trust in this. He did not say do other things. And if you understand that, it's very important. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. There is nothing you can do to save yourself. Not even one. Not even one single one. So when you trust what Jesus did for you, you are immediately sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Once you believe what Jesus did for you, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also you believed, you are sealed with, the, with that Holy Spirit of promise. There's a Holy Spirit who we were promised. We're told you'll we'll get the Holy Spirit after you believe. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Yes. After you believe, you will receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will dwell inside you and he will teach you 
right from wrong. Don't do this, do that. He will always grieve when you're doing something wrong. And then, no, no, don't do that. And we are told to walk in the spirit, don't walk in the flesh. The flesh is five senses. You're seeing, you're hearing, you're smelling, you're sensing, and all those kind of things. The things which tell you, that's a good music. There's a club there. Let me go and have some drinks. Something else tells you, wow, that thing looks good. I want to last about it. That is walking in the flesh. But the Bible tells us, walk in the spirit. The spirit will be inside us, leading us and telling us, this is what you're supposed to do. This is not what you're supposed to do. And he will dwell in us. And he will be our comforter. The time that you're feeling down, I can't do this. I'm just confused. I don't know what I'm going to do. The Holy Spirit inside you, he will speak and he will tell you, don't worry, son. Don't worry, my daughter. Don't worry all these things. Don't worry. He will be there with you. And God has said he will give us the Holy Spirit. Once you believe, you get the Holy Spirit. And he will lead you and show you the right things. When you're broke, when you're poor, you're miserable, he will tell you, don't worry. Trust, I will show you good and greater things. So once you're saved, can you know if you're truly saved? Can you know that you're really, truly, 100% saved? Can you know? Is there a way that you can say, I know that I'm saved? The Bible tells us, yes, you can know. It tells us in 1 John 5.13, These things have written unto you that... that these things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. If you believe on the name of the Son of God, you believe Jesus Christ and all these things that he did for you, you know that you have eternal life. You know that you have eternal life. You are 100% sure because... And Jesus is not man. God is no man that he can lie. If he says, believe, and you'll be saved, he means exactly that. There's no way he will say, believe, and you'll be saved, and then he means another thing. No. You can hold him. He says, uh, uh, I've given you this, and I'm not man that I should lie. And if he says, you will have eternal life if you believe in what he did. And what he told you to believe. And not believe in another doctrine. Don't listen to other people and other doctrines of men. And telling you do this, do that. You say, say this. No, don't. It's like people try to say, don't look at the, the cross. Don't look at the blood. Just do something. They are not telling you the gospel. They want you to be damned in hell. And there's a lot of preaching happening these days about that. As Jesus, do this, do that, do that, do that. That's not what the Bible says. It says, have faith, trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And one more last thing that you can always know that you're saved is if the Holy Spirit is convicting you, is uh, convicting you to different things. He's telling you, don't do that, do that. You can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Where if, you, if you're grieving, anytime you do something wrong, you feel bad about it. You want to uh, abuse someone and then you feel something inside you telling you, no, don't do it, it's not right then you know you have the Holy Spirit. When you want to go and uh, uh, lie to people or be corrupt or be moral or do whatever you want to do, and you feel something inside you telling you, no, no, that's not the right thing. No, you have the Holy Spirit. Because a sinner has no conviction. A sinner has nothing. He doesn't feel anything. He goes and steals. He goes and be corrupt. He goes and lies to people. He does everything and he doesn't feel anything. He doesn't care because there is no Holy Spirit inside him. The only way you can know you're saved is by trusting and believing in the finished work of Christ at the cross. I hope this message is a blessing to you. I hope you've been able to understand something. I hope it is great. Please kindly just share it to other people so that they can also know and learn and be able to be blessed as well. God bless you. See you through maybe in the next, in the next one.